question one from section one of the 2019 Higher Physics Examination. The graph shows how the speed V of a car varies with time t. The average speed of the car during the 12 seconds is given from the following five responses. So let's see how we work out the average speed from a speed time graph. Well, it's quite simple. The average speed V bar is equal to one half of the starting speed plus the final speed and close your brackets. That's the basic equation. So plug in the numbers, we get one half of the starting speed, which is 15 meters per second, plus the final speed, which is 10 meters per second. And that's going to give us one half times 25. So our average speed is a half of 25, which is going to be 12.5 meters per second. And that will give us an answer of E in the multiple choice. Now, you might be wondering, how come we get this formula up here? Why do we get the average speed is a half the starting speed plus the final speed? Well, let's see why. So, using this blank graph without numbers, but just with the variable symbols, the variable letters, we are now able to derive that the average speed V bar is equal to one half of the starting velocity plus the final velocity. So how do you how do we go about doing that then? Well, the key fact is that for a, a speed time graph, the distance gone by the object is equal to the area of the speed time graph. Now, our first job is to split that graph off into a recognizable number of shapes. So I can take that line here, this dash line, and go across to T, and then this one here, and you can see now I've got a triangle on the top and a rectangle on the bottom. So, let's work out the area of these two shapes. Well, the first shape is a rectangle. It's going to be V times T. So, this area in here is just going to be V times T to give us the area of that rectangle. The triangle is a wee bit different because you have to work out this distance here, which is going to be U minus V. And if we work out the area of a triangle, and this one here, we have got one half of, v, of U minus V times T. So one half of the height times the base, and it's a half u minus vt. So the total distance is going to be the following. The total distance s, we'll call that total distance s, is going to be equal to the bottom part, the rectangle vt, plus one half of u minus vt. So what I'll do is I'll multiply out the brackets, to give us a half u, and remember there's a t there as well, minus a half v, and there's a t there as well. You can see the vt and the minus a half vt can cancel out to give us one half of vt, and I'm left with one half of ut. Now I can take out a common factor here, and the common factor is one half t, so I'll write then s is going to be one half, Inside the bracket, I'm going to have V plus U, and there they put the T in that bit to make it a bit more tidier. So there I have an expression S, which is equal to one half of V plus U, which is the same as saying U plus V, times T. But if I go to the data book, I'll find out that the distance gone is equal to the average speed times the time. So it falls in that the average speed, I've got P for this one, average speed V bar must equal one half of V plus U. Or to write it another way, if it's going to be increasing velocity or increasing speed, the average speed would be one half of U plus V. And that's where we get the equation for the first question of the 2019 Higher Physics. Question 2 from section 1 of the 2019 Higher Physics Examination. A stone is thrown at 50 degrees to the horizontal with a speed of 15 metres per second. Which row in the table gives the horizontal component and the vertical component of the initial velocity of the stone? Let's take a look at the diagram. 
we have the vector vector of 50 meters per second at an angle of 50 degrees to the horizontal. Now, like all vectors, we can split that vector into a horizontal component and into a vertical component. To help us, we'll draw a dashed line like that to make up a triangle around the vector. So the horizontal component is quite simple. It's this bit that lies along here. And the vertical component is this bit which lies up here. And we can use our trig to work out the values of the horizontal component and the vertical component. So all I have to do is just draw in VH here to stand for the horizontal component. And I'll draw in VV to stand for the vertical component. So let's start with the vertical component then. The vertical component can be found by the angle here. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So we have sine of 50 degrees is going to be equal to the opposite, VV, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 15. So we cross multiply. We get VV is going to equal to 15 sine of 50 degrees. And that's the value for the vertical component. Now we can do the exact same with the horizontal component. The trig function we're looking for to get this part must be the cosine, because cos of 50 degrees is equal to the adjacent, which is this side here, which is going to be VH, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 15. So once again, we cross multiply and we get VH, the horizontal component, is equal to 15 times cos of 50 degrees. So there we have our two values for the vertical component and the horizontal component. So we're looking for a horizontal component of 15 cos 50 degrees, which could be either this one uh, or that one. But we're looking for a value of the vertical component to be 15 times sine 50, which is that one there. So our final answer is going to be B. Question 3 from Section 1 of the 2019 Higher Physics Examination. A golfer strikes a golf ball which then moves off at an angle to the ground. The ball follows the path shown. The graphs show how the horizontal component of the velocity, VH, and the vertical component of velocity, VV, of the ball vary with time. And we've got to find the speed of the ball just before it hits the ground. Well, the left-hand graph shows you the horizontal velocity of the ball, and you can see that the horizontal velocity of the ball is constant at 40 metres per second. The right-hand graph shows you the vertical component of the velocity, and you can see it starts off at 30 metres per second, it decreases down to zero, and then just at the end of its flight, it will have a velocity of minus 30 metres per second, which means it's pointing down the way. So, when we do this, we make a small dot to stand for the ball. And really what we're doing is we're dealing with vectors. There's a golf ball there. So first of all, at the end of the flight, just, just before it strikes the ground, the golf ball will have a horizontal velocity of 40 metres per second. And we can draw that in like that. That's a horizontal component acting on that ball. It's horizontal velocity uh, of the golf ball. It will also have a vertical velocity as well, and that will be pointing down the way. So the vector will be pointing down the way at the end of its flight, and you can draw it like that. Now, as you can see from that diagram, if we're going to be adding vectors together, the tail of the downward vector is not at the arrow of the horizontal vector. So what we have to do is we can slide this vector over like that to get to there. And then we've got a situation we've got the tail, nose, tail, nose, and then we can find the resultant speed or the resultant size of those two vectors. Another way of doing that is once the vectors are all lined up like that and you don't know which way they're, you see one arrow pointing down the way and one arrow going across this way, is to just simply construct a little rectangle round the two vectors like that. And you know the resultant is going to be always between them like that. Just to sort of show you the full diagram, there is the matching vector sliding over so that the arrow of the horizontal vector will tuck neatly into the tail of the vertical vector. So we have this situation here. We have up here, we have 
40 meters per second along here and this vector of a size of 30 meters per second and you can see that part there's going to be a right angle so the resultant vector will be pointing down in this direction but you're only asked to find the speed of the ball which means the size of that vector and you can see quite neatly we have a 40 times a 30 therefore we have a four three four five triangle will have 50 meters per second pointing down in that direction so the size of that vector is its speed so the speed just before it's the ground must be 50 meters per second and that'll be answer d Question 4 from Section 1 of the 2019 Higher Physics Examination. A car accelerates from rest along a straight level road. The acceleration of the car is constant. Which pair of the displacement time, ST, and the acceleration time, AT, graphs represent the motion of the car? Now let's go back to basics. The displacement S of an object is given by UT, initial velocity times time plus one half a t squared now the car accelerates from rest which means u must be equal to zero so therefore we have s the displacement is equal to simply one half of a t squared now we know that accelerations are constant and we know that half the number is a constant therefore we can say that s is going to be equal to some sort of constant which we'll call k times t squared. Now let's match this up with the y and x axis. The displacement s is really the y axis, so we can put that down as the y axis, a y value. The t value is really the t axis, really corresponds to the x axis, so we can put down k and it'll be an x, and we have to square it. Now, from your maths class, you know that y equals kx squared is a graph which is a parabola. And it looks something like this. If that's going to be x, it's going to be y, it's going to be a parabola sloping up that way. So we're looking for the displacement time graph to be a parabola sloping up the way, which means it could be that one, it could be that one, it's not that one, it's not that one, that's a parabola sloping down the way, that's, that's actually on its side and it's not that one either. Now the other final key fact is that acceleration is constant and if you've got a constant acceleration then the graph shouldn't change. The graph should be a straight horizontal line like that. So it's definitely that one, it's not that one, it's not that one and it's not, but it could be that one, yeah, that's a straight line across, constant acceleration, but it's not that one, because this is the acceleration changing over time. So, from the available evidence we've got, we can say that the two graphs must be long to answer A. The parabola sloping up the way, and the horizontal straight line going across. Question 5 from Section 1 of the 2019 Higher Physics Examination. Four masses on a horizontal frictional surface are linked together by strings P, Q and R. A constant force is applied as shown. Our job is to find out where the tension is going to be greatest and the least in the strings P, Q and R. Now the key thing we have to know in this question is that each of those boxes, the 30 kilogram one, the 20 kilogram one, the 10 and the 40 kilogram one, will all be having the same acceleration. That's the key point. So if I can draw that diagram down here like that, they're, all, they're always going to have the same acceleration. I'm going to choose an acceleration. An acceleration I'm going to choose for simplicity's sake is that each box is going to have an acceleration of one meter per second every second. I don't need to know about the constant force, I just need to know that each box being pulled along the table will have a constant acceleration of one meters per second every second. So let's take a look at the tension needed to give the 40 kilogram box an acceleration of one meters per second every second. So I can just highlight that box, isolate it from the rest, and work out what the acceleration is. So we know that the unbalanced force, which will be the tension in the rope, 
is equal to the mass times the acceleration. We know the mass of the block is 40 kilograms, and we know the acceleration, which we've chosen to be 1. So therefore, we're going to have a tension of 40 newtons. So we can put in there that at R, there's going to be a tension of 40 newtons. Now, let's look at the tension in string Q. So we'll just rub out the unbalanced force part here again. Remembering that we have got an acceleration of that box to be 1 meter per second every second. And I go back and I isolate the 40 kilogram box, which is attached to the 10 kilogram box, to find the tension in Q. Remember that string pulling doesn't know what's behind it, it just knows there's going to be a mass of 50 kilograms behind it. So the unbalanced force, we can work out to be the same idea, mass times acceleration. The mass of the blocks is 50, we've got to have the combined mass this time, times our chosen acceleration is 1 meters per second, and that's going to give us a tension of 50 newtons. So we know in here we've got a tension of 50 newtons. Now let's do the same for the tension in string P. Let's imagine we're rubbing this all out again. And we're looking at the tension in P. And we have to isolate the 40 kilogram one, the 10 kilogram one, and the 20 kilogram one. They're all moving with the same acceleration. So therefore we have the unbalanced force is equal to the mass times acceleration. This time, the tension is pulling these three masses, which is going to give us a total of 40, and 10 is 50, and 20 is 70. So it's 70 kilograms times acceleration of 1, and that's going to give us 70 newtons of a pulling force, 70 newtons of a tension. Now we're in a position to answer the question. The tension in the strings is greatest than P. Well, that's correct. P has got the greatest tension. P has the greatest tension. And the least in Q? Well, it's not the least in Q because we have got R having the least. So tension in R is definitely the least. Part B, the greatest in P and least in R. Well, that's correct. It's the greatest in P and it's the least in R. So that seems to be the favourable one at the moment. Greatest in R. No, it's not the greatest in R, it's only 40 newtons there, so that one is wrong. Greatest in R is wrong again, and we know that the, it's not, the tension is not the same in P, Q and R, we know that. And we know the greatest in P and least in Q is wrong as well. So our answer is going to be B for that question 5. Now the key factor, the key skill in getting that question done is to realise this important thing, that all the boxes will have the same acceleration. 